brothers and my sisters Only they can understand we'll Fight this war together Together we Hey everybody, stand. it's Joe And thanks for tuning in to TVO Campfire What this show's about is about successful veterans And they're bringing you the stories and their experiences And we hope that it can provide inspiration to each of you out there Or maybe a veteran that you know to help in their life Welcome to TVO Campfire. Today we have a United States Air Force veteran who is near and dear to my heart. He's a highly skilled solo entertainer and singer who has been entertaining the audience by putting smiles on faces and warming people's hearts, igniting song in the soul and inspiring people to get up and move. His background in music takes him deep from Texas to the Hollywood music industry and back again. Along the journey, he has developed skills in event management, event planning, singing, television, music production, theater production, songwriting, recording, festivals, interpersonal skills, acting. But more than that, he's done things like, well, music literacy, and he even works with children. And he's going to tell us more about that. Welcome to the show, Jerome, Jerome Roy Sr. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to, glad to be here. Looking forward to speaking with everyone. We're so delighted to have you because you have dedicated your life to just bringing so much joy to people and you have really brought about so much to sharing it with children and bringing out what they have to in literacy and there's so much that we're going to talk about with that too but let's just, just start out with how you started in your own childhood and i know joe you've got some questions so i'm gonna let you kick it off yeah hey first off i i don't even know how you can follow that introduction of your own it looks like you got some big shoes to fill the day on this show with uh, that I'm telling you, man. <laughs> yeah she she definitely lets you up all right so let's, oh, let's yeah. run with it so <laughs> i'll let's go all the way back Let's go all the way back from when you were a little kid growing up. Where were you, where were you born? What were you into? Sports? Did you get um, into music singing? That sort of stuff. Yeah, born in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I basically uh, took an early interest in, well, before school, prior to even school, uh, I grew up in a Baptist church. My mother and father were very very active and not only that we didn't live very far from the church so uh it was a pretty uh constant regime as far as being at church quite a bit uh even during the week and uh a lot of what um uh, has really been a blessing to me i didn't know it at that time or didn't even see it at that time and the value of getting a spiritual background and at an early age and time, uh, how important that would be later on in my life. I didn't have a clue about all that, but they knew and they gave me an opportunity to be exposed to that. And I, I'll always be grateful to them for that because it really is important to have a spiritual base in your life, no matter what you end up doing. And even during that time, I. Um, my mother, I don't, I don't even remember exactly the time when it happened, but I do remember a time when I found myself being a part of a family singing group in the church. My little baby brother and my sister, which is one year older than myself, um, we were all of a sudden doing performances in the church and when we would go visit other churches and that kind of stuck with me. Didn't really, uh, resonate with me until later on but it stuck with me in my memory to uh, never forget you know the opportunities we had to do things like that but I didn't have any idea that 
I would come back to that same music, you know, exposure later on. Like when I got ready to graduate from high school, I got into a talent show and I've always been in growing up a pretty quiet and reserved bachelor type of person. I was tall and skinny <laughs> and everything. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't too boisterous of speaking to people or putting myself out on the front street. So I was really shocked to find myself in a talent show performing some music, singing, in other words, in front of a large crowd. It, it, but it, but what it did is it it, it ignited a, a spark in me and, and, and created a bug for the music at that time to, it, it introduced me to a whole new person that was within me. I, I didn't even know that person existed. And so, and so after that, that's really what kind of sparked my interest to uh, after high school to go ahead and join the military because at that time, of course, you know, the draft was still going on. This was like in the late sixties um, and everything. So uh, I, um, I wanted to get that out of the way just in case uh, something really developed with the music that wouldn't be a situation as far as getting drafted right in the middle of a, something happening in music career. So that was my reason for making that decision. So uh, a lot of things happened, but I do know you probably have a few other questions about the military. So I won't jump too far into that and <laughs> let you take it from there. <laughs> Yeah, I actually kind of want to go back. Where, um, what part of Dallas and like, what high school do you end up? It was, it was actually in the uh, East Dallas, like right, you know, there's a state fair um, in Dallas and the actual uh, uh, church in my house was, I'd say about maybe 10 or 11 blocks down south of the uh, state fairgrounds. And so um, that was I basically called it Southeast Dallas. And I went to a, a, a elementary school that was called Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And I uh, was there for elementary, probably up until the, uh, I think maybe fourth or fifth grade. And then that's when at the time my mom and dad made a transition and moved, um, not necessarily out of Dallas, but on the borderline of Dallas and Wilma Hutchins, which at the time, uh, made a change for me educational wise because the school that I was assigned to go to at that time was not in Dallas Independent School District. It was actually in Wilma Hutchins. They called it Wilma Hutchins School District. Uh, that ISD doesn't doesn't exist anymore, but at that time it did. So I was um, required to go to that particular school, and that was the school I was telling you about where I ended up doing the talent show and everything. And before the talent show, I had an interest in basketball. I, th I thought I wanted to, to, to really make a career in basketball. I, I had a passion for it. But um, as I was getting a little older toward the end of my high school, my competition was getting bigger, much bigger and stronger, stepping on my toes, squashing my big toes and everything. I said, wait a minute. This is, this is not the way this should go. I, I need to get bigger and stronger or I need to think of something else to do, you know? So that's um, basically where I kind of grew up at. And, and that again was the area where I was in school and the latter part was in the, on the borderline of Hutchins, Wilma Hutchins in Dallas. Now, did you have family in the military or did you know anybody at that time in the military? I had an uncle that was a, a career veteran in the army. I think he probably, he spent more than 20 years in there, which was another blessing for me uh, because uh, once I was in the military and, and doing my little stench, I got assigned to go over to Germany. And um, I was stationed at uh, Simbach, Germany, which is right um, close to a little town called Kaiserslautern. And um, just turns out he was not far, he was stationed over there at that particular time, not far from where I was. And so that was a really blessing for me to be able to uh, engage with him over there and spend some time. It, it, it just really, really, really was a blessing to me because I 
he was like a dad. I mean, it's just as good as me seeing my dad over there. And he was just that close of an uncle to me. And he was so proud to to show me around to his friends and and all that. So it was it was really good. I really enjoyed that. How did you decide which branch you were gonna enlist in? Well, um actually uh I kind of just maybe took a look at the different branches and for some reason I know it just the Air Force uh, kind of just attracted my attention, appealed to me a little bit more. Uh, and um, I wasn't really thinking in terms of trying to really be involved in as far as a lot of serious things related to combat and things like that. Uh, but I, I, I was more or less thinking in terms of business and administration because uh, right before I finished high school, I fell in love with bookkeeping and accounting, one of the courses I was taking in high school, and I really had a, you know, a little desire to want to pursue that. So when I enlisted, I wanted to uh, go into the field of business and administration, um, but unfortunately, that didn't that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty interesting. So did you know at that time that you were also an entertainer? Well, yes, I did. Matter of fact, there, ever since the high school talent show and I, I met this new person inside of me, I liked, I liked that person and, and, I, and it gave me a lot of confidence that, well, you, you really can do something in front of a large crowd and as bashful and shy as you are, I found out that once you step on that stage, it's, it's a whole different world. And uh, you, don't, you don't think about hardly anything else other than what's going on on that stage. And, that, and it's, and it, and it's a, a good place. <laughs> I love it. Did you have any uh, perception kind of about the military prior to going in? And you're just like, hey, I'm just going to go tackle this head on. Or he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm doing it and I'm going to make my own success. Yeah. Um, and I guess I guess my situation was because of my commitment just wanted to do the service because of the draft situation. I didn't want to be get involved with some music and then get drafted uh, because something like that happened at that particular time to Elvis Presley. And I paid attention to that. So I said, well, you know, I don't want that to happen to me. Should I have an opportunity to do, to do something with music? I wouldn't want that to happen to me. So the only way to solve that is, is just go ahead and, and, and you know, enlist. And and do you do your duty, and that way, that can't happen, you know. So uh, that was kind of my motivation, but it turns out that it was a, a blessing in disguise as well because even while I was over in Germany um, in the military, I had an opportunity. I would sit in with different bands as they would every month. They would change and have bands come through, and I would sit in with the different bands that, that came through and they gave me a little taste of what it really feels like to be performing with live musicians and instruments and things like that with people. Because with the talent show, uh, that was just a little taste to kind of get me ready. And even though I did just a little bit more performing um, locally, uh, not a whole lot, but uh, whenever I had some opportunities, I had put a little singing group together to try to do some things and, you know, most of all exposure and things like that. But, but once I got in the military and, and, and received that opportunity, I was even able to get free leave of absence for a while to participate. They have a European wide talent contest over there. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but at that time they were. And uh, so I was able to even be relieved of duty and and go participate in that because I guess by you know representing the base that I was coming from, you know they they uh, supported me with that, and that that paid off for me really really good too because we we did a good job and and got some good exposure and 
it was a really great experience for me just to be able to do that. So um, uh, after that particular situation happened, I also met, uh, continued to meet other entertainers that were coming through visiting and uh, was off, even offered a, an opportunity to travel with one of them. They said, if you, if you wasn't in the military, we would love for you to travel and tour with us. And they were going all over Europe. And I mean, just all over the place. It was a family group, brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and things like this, but they were a really good group. And uh, they had a lot of talent. One, the guitar player spoke seven languages. <laughs> so I said, wow, this is, this is amazing. That's a good deal. I, I know a lot of those places I went to, I, I wished I would have had a translator. <laughs> Said, right <laughs> here right. i am the, the here i am the big tall american walking around all these places just doing the head nod like yeah you know yeah. i don't whatever but yeah so when yeah. you when you first when you first came in uh you're on the enlisted side of the house Drew? yes uh i did enlist and i was supposed to be in there for four years but you know as i mentioned to you earlier because i had uh signed up to be in the business administration uh, unfortunately, uh, I think I was, it was either San Antonio or somewhere like that uh, while I was doing my basic training. Um, somehow, because of, I guess, the Vietnam War going on at the time, they had a very high need for people in security and law enforcement. So, unfortunately, uh, unbeknownst to me, in other words, until after the fact, they switched me over to a different career side of things with the law enforcement security law. I said, well, that's not what I signed up for. And we know, we know, we know, we, but just, you know, kind of stay with us and we'll, we'll do all we can to get you, you know, where you signed up for and cross trained and everything. I, and I kind of went through that for about two years, um, you know, hearing that Saturday story, so to speak. But it eventually came down when I, was in Germany over there serving my tour over there that uh, they gave me an option. They said, well, I'll tell you what, um, this was a military lawyer that, that jumped in and spoke up, spoke up for me and said, look, you either gonna cross train this man uh, now, or you going to give him an early out and he received the same honorable discharge that he would receive if he stayed the full four, four years. And of course he said that, you know, it's up to you, you know, what would you like to do? You wanna, you know, finish out the four years or you wanna take the early out with the two years that you have already. And it was exactly two years. <laughs> and uh, he said, but you, I said, are you sure it's the same on with this charge that I would get, uh, you know, during the full four years? He said, yes, yeah. So I said, you know what? Uh, for two years, they kept kind of stringing me along and things like this. I said, I, I, I just really don't want to take the chance anymore. Um, if, if what you're telling me is true, then I'll go ahead and take the early out. And that's, that's what I did. So across, across that whole time that you were in, was Germany the only place you, you, got, to, you got to really go and just visit Did, or slash enjoy, as some people like to say? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I see, what was it? Um, I think Arkansas. Arkansas, I think, is one of the other places where I was temporarily assigned at one time. And um, I think just maybe a couple of places in the States before I, I got shipped over to uh, Germany to do, my, to do that tour duty over there. Uh, so, uh, but even everywhere I went, it was kind of the same thing. I would I immediately try to find out well, what's going on with the music scene around here, <laughs> you know, and even, you know, meeting a lot of guys from different places all over the country. That's, that's one thing I really uh, enjoyed about the military as well. You meet so many guys from different places and I mean, just great people uh, with a lot to share, a lot of stories to tell and a lot of uh, camaraderie, you know, there. Uh, and it's, it's a good thing. And, and the good thing about um, Uncle Sam is that, of course, you grow up pretty fast. You know, you learn to, 
you know, not be dependent on everybody else, depend on yourself first, you know, and he, he, he gets you, um, what you call, uh, orientated pretty fast, you know, especially boot, boot, <laughs> boot camp, you know, um, learn how to pick up behind yourself, clean up and make your own bed. I mean, not just make your bed or pull the covers up, you make the bed. I mean, <laughs> in other words, okay, you may have made your bed at home that way, but let me show you how we do it here and how you're going to do it from now on. <laughs> and so <laughs> all of that culture shock of that was pretty exciting, you know, and uh, again, you couldn't really complain too much because if, if you're not being single out, everybody dances to the same music. And that's what I kind of enjoyed about that too. You know, you just, you learn, you learn a lot. You know, it teaches you a lot about responsibility, you know, how to uh, be creative and, and just how to uh, learn to grow up and, you know, you know, not say forget about everything mom and dad teaches you, but, but learn how to learn some new things and do things in different ways that's gonna make you a better person, you know. So do you stay in touch with any of those friendships and relationships that you developed from your time in service? Well, I wish I could say yes, but uh, the most people that I, I mean, the most guys that I was in doing service with in Germany, I have no idea where those guys, uh, you know, originated, I mean, went to, and it's just, um, you know, a disconnect at that particular time, but but those memories will always be embedded and instilled in my mind because uh, like the guys that I was singing with, some of them was not even in my particular, uh, you know, unit or anything. You know, they were, they were doing different jobs in different uh, parts, uh, sections on the base and everything, but it just so happened that when it came to that particular music project, that's how we became very close, like brothers and got to travel together and, and do something we really enjoyed with that passion for music and everything. And so uh, I'll never forget those guys uh, because matter of fact, that particular singing group, uh, I was actually in competition against, it was like a five man, um, I take that back. I mean, it was a, it was a, a three man singing group and myself and another person were competing in the talent show. And those guys actually won the talent show uh, on that base, but they liked the way we sounded so much that they said, well, hey, would you guys like to join us? And so we became a five man singing group and that's what helped us to go further in the competition. <laughs> that's fantastic. And yeah. you were saying, I mean, you ended up loving entertainment so much. This is what you've done for your entire life. And you have done so many things after you ended up finishing your contract, you took your early out. Did you end up seeing anybody else that from some of these um, gigs that went on within the military uh, the some of the talent shows that you had, did you see them trying out for any of the same performances or um, just or on the entertainment road? I mean, you, you went from Texas to Hollywood and um, on other, other roads throughout your journey did you see them trying out for some of the same things or well as far as the military uh counterparts there i i never crossed paths with any of those guys again but in my journey um as far as in california is concerned uh, when i came back to texas um you know the whole thing was basically i still wanted more opportunities than what was available in Dallas, Texas. So uh, unfortunately that meant leaving Texas, which I did do uh, the, at the beginning of 1970 and ended up being in California for a complete whole decade uh, until the beginning of 1980. But 
in the beginning of 1970, coming into California after the uh, the love child type movement in California, everybody loved each other and wanted to hug you and and <laughs> and just show their love and everything. Uh, came in on the on the cups of that um, at a good time because again, a lot of especially musicians were very open to sharing and embracing you no matter who you were and where you came from and all that so it was a good time to come into that environment uh, i was in san francisco in the bay area and uh, met a lot of people from that particular area oakland berkeley a lot of people um in the bay area uh were doing some things musically that was during the time when very popular groups like the whispers and whispers and uh, tower power all these uh, guys were emerging pretty, you know, pretty fast. And fortunately for me, um, there was a, a local band that worked with me uh, at one time and a guitar player and I said guitar player, bass player and drummer uh, that was working with that particular band went on to be, become a part of uh, Barry White's uh, live performing orchestra. And they were with him for about a couple of decades. And so that is how I ended up um, getting a chance to, as far as doing some, having an experience in, in Hollywood and getting to learn some things was the guitar player that was um, with Barry White was someone that I had met locally in, in San Francisco. And so he was like a brother to me. He was, he was very down to earth and didn't mind sharing. and teaching me some things about what was going on in his world of the superstars, so to speak. <laughs> and that, that really helped me a lot, gave me a, a lot of insight. He, he invited me to come to one of the rehearsals that uh, Barry uh, Orchestra that they do before they get ready to go out on tour. That taught me a lot about how the machinery works and how some of the things behind the scene works with the big people. And so it was just, it was a good, a good thing, a good experience. And uh, I really appreciated that uh, from him at the time. Uh, he's, he's expired now, he, he passed away a few years back, but, but I still uh, uh, owe him a lot for what he shared with me and helped me to do. And, uh, and I did get a chance to, you know, do some things uh, while I was there that uh, helped me to grow and, and to, to benefit uh, from everything I learned while I was in there during that decade. And right before I got ready to leave California, <laughs> I mean, uh, to kind of wrap up things, so to speak, um, God tapped me on the shoulder. And you mentioned about the children earlier. He tapped me on the shoulder and just says, uh, hey, buddy, uh, I have a little something I need you to do for me. And uh, I had no idea that that little taste of working with children, which came from a grant from the California Arts Council. I had no idea that when God said, I want you to do this, that I would end up doing it for quite a while after that happened. But it let me know that this was part of something that became, you know, part of my purpose of what he created me for it. And that's to help our children because he made me understand, you know, the children are our future. And without them, we really have no future. And so you have to focus on them. Uh, and I've been telling people that for years, you need to focus on the children because if we don't work with them and help them and guide them and you know nurture them, then we don't have a future. I mean, so uh, that's why I still to this day, because I, once I promised God that I would do that for him for the rest of my life, then I'm still doing it and I still, uh, you know, plan to continue doing it as long as I'm breathing. <laughs> when you got out, did they have any type of a separation assistance program for you or did you have any idea what you were going to do? Well, not, not really. I really didn't uh, tell you the truth and, and the, the main thing <laughs> the main thing that I was thinking about at that time is, you know, how to get things going and getting back into the desire and the 
focus on trying to pursue something with the music. And so um, that's what my agenda was at the time. And that's why uh, I immediately um, basically got in school uh, because of doing my uh, upbringing in the music industry, everything was by the ear. I didn't read, I didn't know how to read or write music at all. I look at the, I look at the notes and stuff like that on paper. I said, well, it looks like Greek to me. <laughs> how does anybody understand all that? <laughs> so that was my first order of business coming back, uh, you know, to uh, Texas. I uh, enrolled in a commercial music program at the Cedar Valley College and they had excellent teachers that were all graduates from uh, University of North Texas. Um, and they weren't just great musicians, but they were great teachers and beautiful spirits. And I just, uh, to this day, I, 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 I'm still grateful to them for everything they shared and for all that I learned from just watching how they did as teachers and working with the youth. And, you know, I was a much older person at the time when I finally got to that point to get some form of training, but uh, I didn't, didn't worry about that. I didn't think about it because I was there not to please other people. I was there for myself. I mean, it was, a, it was for me, for my own personal gain. And that's all that really mattered to me at the time. So I did go ahead and go on to be you know, able to get my, uh, I got two degrees from that program. Uh, one in, um, in commercial uh, music arrangement and uh, the other one was in uh, recording technology because I learned from the, the previous background experience that it's good to have the music and the talent on, and when you're in the recording studio on one side of the glass, but when you don't know what's going on, on the other side of that glass, it's, it, it could be a problem and it, it's, it's a disadvantage. So I said, you know, I'm definitely want to correct that. I want to know what's going on on the other side of that glass. So when they say, well, can we do this takeover again? Why? You know, it's not always cause you messed up. Sometimes they wasn't ready or they didn't do something, but how are you going to know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and Jerome, correct me if I'm wrong, but also too that really makes the artist um, that really makes them vulnerable because yes. they can sit there and they're putting forth their their talent, their effort. A lot of them, a lot of young artists are out there with their own money, trying to sit there and do it as well. Yes, and, and it's like you can get put, it. yep, and you can get put through the ringer really, really quick. Yeah. If you're an aspiring artist and you don't understand what's going on on the other side of the glass, as you say. So yeah. I, I definitely appreciate you doing that. I know, I know quite a few veterans that have gotten out and are pursuing uh, music careers. Um, and, and so it's good to hear you talk about that too, because that's something that hasn't been talked about yet on our show. Mm. Uh, that th this right here, what you're talking about, can really come into play and help some musicians out. Um, yes. Yeah. Are you open, so like with you, with you working with the children and stuff that you mentioned earlier? Do you do that just on your own, or do you are you oh. working through a certain program or an organization that we could talk about? Well, actually, um, I'm an independent contractor, and so basically, I just have been doing that strictly from contracts. Uh, I've worked with, I'm a, con I'm a vendor with the city of Dallas and also Dallas Independent School District. I'm also a, a vendor with uh, Fort Worth uh, Independent School District in, in the city of Fort Worth. But most of my uh, opportunities that have occurred in the past few years have been with the city of Dallas and also with Dallas ISD. And uh, it mostly centers around doing enrichment programs for children uh, at the elementary level. And, and the reason why I specialize at the elementary level, again, because uh, when I say that I truly believe that they're our future, well, the thing is, God showed me that my specialty would be working with the clay when it's still soft and easy to shape and mold. And that's where the elementary kids come in. 
Not saying you can't help the kids when you get to middle school and the high school level, but when you working with the elementary, the babies, I'm talking about the babies that like, you know, you know, sometimes pre-K, K, kindergarten, first grade, and the second, all the way up to say maybe fourth grade, where you still have some 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 little spirits there that can be really, really blessed by what you are willing to share. And and you know, they they know each generation that comes along, they really know they have a, a instinct for it. Um, and they're very uh, you know, say progressively gaining as far as uh automatic technical you know, abilities, just because it's just the time. Um, so they know when you're trying to share some, something with them because you really care about them. If, if you wanted the artists that you're there just to try to collect a check, uh, they see right through that and they, they make it pretty hard for you if you're one of those kind of artists. <laughs> they, they've ran a lot of artists out of the building crying uh, because of that. Uh, they see through no. them and they, you know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they know, you know, I, and you know, the thing about it, um, I guess that's one of my alter egos as far as being a comedian or whatever. Um, I entertain them. I'm not just there to teach you. Uh, I'm going to do anything I can to make sure you learn. And because I want to give you as much as me, uh, you know, as I, as I possibly can. And that means if you're bored, don't ever tell me you're bored because that's just gonna make me work even harder to make sure that I get to you. So if I have to, if I have to use comedy, uh, whatever I need to do to keep your attention and to keep you engaged, well, we're gonna have some fun, first of all, and we're gonna learn a lot together. Cause you know, I, I don't just, I learn in other words, as a teacher to teach is to learn because not only was I teaching them, but I was learning from them all this time. And they, they have taught me well. I learned a lot of their tricks and, and a lot of their mindsets. So it's hard for any of them to get around me these days because I've learned from the best <laughs> out there. Jerome, you also teach music literacy. Well, it's called media media literacy. Excuse me, media literacy. And I, yes, I really want to talk about that because this is an area that really is going untouched or at least unnoticed, I should say. And thank you for sharing that and um, correcting me on that because I think it's something that needs to be talked about. Well, I'm glad you said it because for me, until I was exposed to and trained in media literacy education, uh, I was just like everybody else. I had, I didn't even, as, as much as I had been involved with music, no one ever told me or no one ever shared with me or even mentioned to me music, about music being a type of media. I never thought about it that way. And the, the lady that my, my mentor that trained me, I said, are you sure music is a type of media? She said, yeah. I said, wow. Mm. I said, this, this changes everything for me. This is a game changer because everything I had been doing, uh, thinking about doing and working with children and everything, it made me realize everything to do with the music and, and everything that's related to it, it all falls up on the media. And so I said, hmm, you know, I really see now the big picture of the, um, everything can fall up under the umbrella of media literacy because we all use media in everything we do 24 seven in some shape, form or fashion. We, whether it's electronic media, print media, any vision media, whatever, but we all use it in our teaching, in our training, in our, in our uh, uh, entertaining, in our whatever we're doing, everybody in the in the religious areas, in the commercial end of things, in the educational end of things, we all use media. It's just a matter of what type of media it is, 
and what 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 are you trying to what you what audience are you trying to reach is of what determines what type of media you're going to use in your efforts or in your um, you know activities. So um, I took that and ran with it, and it and it just automatically allowed me to be able to go back to the drawing board and redraft all my programs that I would possibly even dream of doing with children uh, and put it all up under the umbrella of media literacy. Now, there was a definition, it's maybe a little outdated for some people, but it's still what I use with the children to work for the definition for media literacy. And it's just simply that media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate and produce communication in a variety of forms and media technologies. Now they come up with a variety of, you know, of, of, of that definition, but it still boils down to the same thing, to be honest with you. Uh, and then I, when I first tell the, the kids that um, definition, <laughs> I said, listen, I know that definition sounds like it's five miles long, but I have a formula where I can teach it to you to learn that definition and make it seem like it's only like two feet long. So I give them a little incentive and offer $5 for the first person that learns that formula and, and will be able to recite that entire definition that I just gave you. Don't add any words and don't leave out any words. Don't, don't omit anything, in other words. So <laughs> to see like a first or second grader get up on the stage and repeat that definition or recite that definition in front of everybody and get and nail it on the head is 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 very very rewarding <laughs> and they they may not know it but they plant a seed in their head that later on they can start to analyze that definition and really truly learn the meaning of every single part of it and that's that's great yeah no, absolutely, man. And, and and to me, it's very admirable on you doing that because I know that takes a lot, a lot of patience to be able to do that as well. And, and I have to say, that's probably one of the key things I learned while I was in the military was patience. That old hurry up and wait, right? It, yeah. What's some of the, what's some of the what's some of those things that you took from you know, your time in the military that was able to transition and you were able to still use today in your industry that you're that with me. Well, um, some of the things that I shared with you about what I experienced and doing my tour of duty, uh, especially overseas, where I spent the longest length of time uh, serving. Um, it just so much you learn from other people and uh, their life experiences. I mean, people do a lot of things that may be good or bad, but you learn from both, uh, both of those things. And uh, some of the discipline that the military uh, basically instilled upon me and the tenacity of, you know, just pushing yourself to do better. I mean, I went in, went in as an airman first class but I came out as an E3. And so um, that was a, that wasn't just by chance. Uh, you have to work toward those things and you, and you learn and you grow and you, and you learn also from watching um, the different levels of authority uh, all the way up to the, you know, the lieutenants, the captain lieutenants and the other up to the five star generals, you learn that there's a lot to go along with those responsibilities. And you and you can watch and just, you gain a lot and, and, and you can use a lot of analogies of what goes on in the military with what actually happens in civilian life. A lot of the things that, you know, like uh, with the military sort of being like its own world, you have your own city, your own government style of, of things. And, and, and when you compare that to I think that's what also even helped me, in other words, to transition back into civilian life because a lot of what you learn through the military life 
is very similar and parallel to some of the things in civilian life. It's just that to me, the military has, a, I would say, maybe a little bit more control over some things than what civilian life. Uh, in civilian life, you, <laughs> you always have to kind of unexpect the unexpected. But in military, everything is sort of regimented, so to speak, and they have a lot more control over what happens in that city or in that government style and things like that, which is not a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing because when you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have to work in a system, well, it's good that it is very, very well organized and a well organized machine. Because uh, I can imagine the chaos that it would be if it was not. <laughs> so, matter of fact, the, the, the civilian life could learn a lot from the military life. Yeah, on some on some things. <laughs> yeah, on some things. <laughs> yeah, no, on some things. It's like yeah, I know. Depending on what industry you're in, that that military can actually hinder you. So yeah. you know, it's uh, we found that out the hard way too. And, how yeah. flexible, how flexible have you kind of had to like, well, I should say flexible and, and like adaptable too. Have you had to become when you left the service? Well, um, I had to um, really become really f flexible and adaptable to things. Uh, but uh, you know what, that, that really is, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that really is part of what some of the attributes I gained from being in the military. I can't say that if I didn't have the military background that that I would have been able to do some of the things later on in my life that I was presented with had not been for some of the things that were instilled upon me uh, in the military. Because in, in the military, you do have to learn to be flexible and to adapt. And sometimes very, very quickly. I mean, or sometimes instantaneously. So, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, that's a positive thing rather, you know. And so I think that's what helped me uh, as far as, cause you know, the, the music industry and even sometimes in education and everything, uh, nothing is ever guaranteed. And, and, you know, you can have all the, the, the pipe dreams and everything else in, in the world, but nothing is ever guaranteed. So that means you you will have to continue to um, be flexible and you will have to continue to adapt. Now, there, there used to be a time when people would make fun of folks that would say, well, oh, so you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that. Oh, so you definitely must be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Well, you don't hear that that phrase hardly use hardly at all anymore in this generation, in this day and age. Because now, the more flexible you are and the more you're able to adapt to different things, you, 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 know, you can use that as an advantage or it becomes an advantage. Because the people that say, well, it's no, not say no such thing, but it's very few and far between that people will do the same thing for 10, 15, 20, or 30 years anymore. So what happens to those people that only did that one thing for 10, 15, 20, or 30 years? Now we have the, the growth of technology emerging at a rapid pace, very rapid pace. And, and, and that, say, interjected itself into what you were doing for so many years. And what you were doing didn't involve that technology. Well, what are you going to do if you're going to survive? You're either going to adapt and become, uh, utilize the technology and, and, and survive again and, and make sure you can keep being a part of what you're doing, or you won't survive. So that's part of what, um, you know, the benefit for me especially with media literacy. You know, I said, um, when I first got into that and I wanted to start blessing people with, with the knowledge of what I had been exposed to with media literacy and the benefits of it, I said, well, you know, I already know lots of people will not even listen to me. They won't even think about it. 
because it's hard for people sometimes to understand and, and agree with what you're saying if they really don't know anything about it. And then a lot of times I found some people are being a little bit arrogant minded. Well, how could he know what he's talking about or about something that I don't know about? I mean, it must not be anything what he's talking about because if it was, I would know about it. So they, they kind of blow you off in other words. And so I just learned to don't let that bother you. You know, you just, you just keep trying to help those that will listen. And, and whether they get it right then or not, I've had lots of friends that told me, man, you know what? You used to say that, tell me about media literacy all time, long time ago. But well, I finally see what you're talking about now, uh, how important it is. And, and I started doing this and I started doing that. And uh, I really am um, glad you did kind of open my eyes to that. I said, hey, you know, my eyes had to be open. And that's what blessed me. But again, you know, this, what we're going through right now, this pandemic should make it much easier for people to see the need for media literacy. And, and I've, I've shared this with the people, the organization that I work with uh, is in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, they're like our advocacy group that helps a lot of media literacy uh, educators around the country. Um, try to get support from the politicians and legislators uh, to support media literacy education and legislation to get some laws changed to make it mandatory, you know, for uh, children K through 12 to be able to benefit from that education for media literacy by making it a part of the essential elements. Because you know how it is in society if something, a lot of times, if it's not mandated, uh, it gets put on the back burner, burner. And they'll spend more time teaching tests to keep their ratings up and things like this, uh, sometimes, unless it's a part of the essential elements. And because that oh, way- uh, abs Absolutely. Uh, now, yeah. now, Jerome, I, I can tell you straight up. So we're over at a, uh, we're over at a dinner the other night and um you know they're taking me through the home and you know showing me the home and everything and it, and it came to the teenagers room and this is where i have seen a big dynamic shift usually teenage you know in teenagers rooms it would be you know posters and sports and so <laughs> you know the type of stuff you know going now it seems the teenagers' rooms have turned into a studio. I mean, yeah. it's it's got it's got the camera on, it's got lights, it's got different backgrounds, it's got different, you know, it's like a stage setup now. It's, yes. it's all of a sudden, and this whole thing, you know, this whole YouTube craze and follow me and followers and TikTok and whatever else, and it, you know, they're getting it. So yes, I can see exactly what you're talking about on where they really do need to to take a strong stance on the education side of the house into media literacy because these kids are just jumping online and just going rent, you know, and yeah. letting their creativity, I mean, let's be honest, letting that creativity run, you know, per se. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I've witnessed what you're talking about firsthand right there and I really wish they would uh, do it. Um, yeah, I, would it I'm glad you said that because, uh, we need all the help of people that do see the, the problem, you know, um, and everybody a lot of time can see the problem, but even when they see it, what we need help with is people that are willing to be a part of the solution. And the only way that that's going to happen is through media literacy legislation. That means people, not just like myself or yourself and, and anybody else I'm saying that, that can see it, uh, talking to their their political leaders and and you know letting them know like things just a simple thing like what you just said can make them see from a regular uh, constituents point of view in other words uh, that there really must be something that needs to be done and again you couldn't ask for a better example than this pandemic to pull the cover off of the the problem. Uh, so that people can see uh, these educators, they know that just like they were 
these children were, the parents were thrust into a situation where all of a sudden the majority of our children are being homeschooled and the parent was not ready for the homeschooling. The kids were not ready. The household is not ready for homeschooling. They don't have a clue about well, what do you start with this type of environment. Uh, so the benefit of media literacy is that it teaches the children the theory behind all the different types of media, whether it's electronic, the print media, the visual media, any type of media, they learn just like, you know, music, in other words. You, like I was telling you earlier, I went off my ear. That's all I had. But when I learned the theory behind music, oh man, that's so much more to the world of music when you have the theory side of the music. And that's what's messing with these kids right now because one of the first things I learned in media literacy education in that workshop I did, in other words, is that all media has some type of implications. It just depends on what that person that's dealing with the media, what the motivation is for them. Was it something commercial? Is it political? You know, what is the, what is the motivation? But whatever you create will have some implications. And this is what the kids don't understand because nobody's teaching them about the theory of the media, the, especially the different types of media. You may, you may be good at the electronic media, but what about the print media? The things that you reading and seeing, you know, in print. How are you gonna interpret that if you're not still aware again of the theory? And look, the music is the same analogy. You can learn this keyboard by the person putting your hands and showing you what fingers, finger numbers and things like this to use. And same thing with the guitar, any other instrument. But at some point, somebody needs to be telling you about the theory. You know, why does this note uh, sound good going from this note to the other? Or what makes a difference? How do you know which note to go to? How do you know how to create music, period? That's, that's where the theory of media literacy comes in. So I it's think, very important. I think there's a lot of really very valuable information in what you're sharing and some very important points with everything that's going on in the climate right now, especially those that may be considering utilizing the military for an educational career in the future because there's so much that cannot be taken away detrimentally that is out there once it's put out on the internet. Right, so right. There's a lot that really needs to be said for parental involvement right now in everything that children are doing uh, that are in the cyber world. It, once it's on the internet, it's out there. And even right. things are supposedly scrubbed, it, there's a lot that can't be that can't be taken away. And I really appreciate that you're sharing that. And with this being a veteran based show, this is really important because as we've talked about on the show before, those that are veterans oftentimes raise veterans. So I know Joe, you've got some more questions though for Jerome about his prior service or um, <laughs> I can see your, I can see yeah. already. So. No, no, he, he touched on a lot of good stuff that hasn't happened on this show yet. And so I, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, you, you touched on some really good points, whether it's, it's someone getting out of the service that's going to that's gonna be a starving artist per se on the musical scene, or if it's somebody that wants to get into music education, you know, as well. Uh, you touched on the on the media literacy aspect quite in depth that that we had not had on this show yet. So thank you for that. Um, I w one thing I, I want to give you the opportunity, the stage to do right now, is talk of um, let's what is in the next five years for you, and and also what advice would you give to veterans before we close out this show? Okay, uh, 
as far as the next five years, um, I would say that I want to continue to explore uh, definitely uh, any musical opportunities that I will have to uh, grow in the music industry. Uh, God has actually put into my spirit to, to create starting this year a um, gospel music label and to allow that music label to be a family of believers that will put him first and that will learn how to share with each other uh, on the benefit of the success of whoever's out front. That means everybody in the family will support the people out front. And no matter what talents you bring to the table, the family will be only as strong as his weakest link. But when we have a weak link, everybody in the family will work to nurture and grow and strengthen that weak link so that it no longer becomes or is a weak link. And that way we will continue, we keep that philosophy with the gospel music label. We will continue to make a difference and have an impact and a voice in the industry out here. Uh, as a songwriter, uh, I was already, I'm already blessed with quite a few songs that I haven't recorded yet that God gave me when I first got saved. And so this is one of the first things that I will be focusing on with this new gospel label is to start uh, utilizing what God has given me as far as the, the material that he gave me. He gave me enough for two CDs, actually yeah, more. And uh, I'm lo looking forward to um, exploring that and to, to involve other people to get that going. I'm also working with a person that's over, I mentioned Germany earlier, where I, I have a associate is, that's gonna be working with me in, in Germany that uh, will be sort of duplicating and mirroring everything that we do with the music label here, they will do over in Germany to promote and to uh, grow the label over there in Germany. And that was one thing before I left Germany, I always said before I left the military over there in Germany, I said, whenever I come back to Germany, I hope and pray that it's my music, not a vacation uh, that brings me back to Germany. And it looks like that opportunity is, is possibly gonna take place in other words this year. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about that. And my advice, that I would give to any of the veterans that uh, would be coming out of the service and just like I did, uh, start utilizing whatever benefits that you are eligible for, especially with education. That, that was a real blessing for me, uh, again, for someone that, that had a great ear, but did, was not formally trained with music, didn't know one note from the other, uh, that was a blessing for me to be able to use my benefits to, to get that education. Um, and, and it just, it was a real blessing. I know that it was, and it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have those benefits. And so that um, you can only, not only use it for the education, you can use it for, you know, with uh, here in Texas, they have what they call Texas Veteran Land Board Program that if, you, if you're a Texas vet, you can look into that, try to take advantage of that. And then, and then all veterans basically have, you know, the benefit of programs as far as housing. A lot of that has changed now. There's a lot more funds available for that than it used to be many years ago. So it's a lot of things um, uh, that they should look into and they should take advantage of, you know, while they can, because things do change over time. So try to get all you can can get while you can and, and benefit and better yourself and grow yourself. And then also keep up out for opportunities like what's happening here right now on this show. Look out for more like-minded veterans that are doing very positive and great things and going forward in the future and try to take advantage of those opportunities as well because you never know what God has in the plan for you. That's it. Well, once again, sir, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Rebecca. But what I want to close out with just for me is, is you, 
you have become an inspiration to children. And I appreciate that. Thank and there's you. probably, there is prop, I, I'm willing, I'm willing to bet there's probably no way in the world to count how many veterans you've already influenced in your, in your life just through their own children or grandparents. Yes. You know, when, 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 the, when grandparents can see their kid get on that stage or get on there and perform because of something yeah. that you've worked with. Yeah. I, I know this. I, I, I just look at them and I, I, but by no means am I anywhere near a grandparent yet, but I could just sit there and look in the faces of grandparents and see when they, when watching their little, their, their little ones, you know, yeah. up there on that stage too. So even though you're working with children, you are still influencing and you're making an impact on veterans throughout, throughout the, the Texas yeah. for sure. But yes. I'm pretty sure the way with media is nowadays, recording videos, sending them out, faith, you know, social media, et cetera, you're probably influencing people around the world and you don't even know it. So thank mm -hmm. you, sir. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jerome, for every day getting up and answering the call and being so dedicated all the time. I've known you for a long time and this is what you do and you are so cheerful about it always. So thank you. And thank you for taking the time out to share your journey with so many today. It's been my pleasure and thank you so much, Rebecca. And uh, I always uh, consider it being a blessing to be able to, uh, you know, share and uh, allow God to do what he's really always inspiring us to do, which is to try to love each other and share and, and help and bless each other in any way, shape, form, and fashion that we can, especially where the children are concerned. So uh, I do look forward to being a part of future campfires and uh, especially anything outdoors. I, I love performing, uh, doing music outdoors. That, that's, that's, oh, that's a great joy to me. So um, if I can do anything to help the organization as far as fundraising and doing some events outside, uh, I would just really be too happy to, to be involved with that. Thank you, thank you. And we want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of TVO Campfire. Please make sure to share this with all of the veterans that you know, those who are on active duty, those who are thinking about becoming members of the United States military. Share this with everybody that you know that's on social media, everybody that you know all over. But we appreciate you tuning in and taking the time to listen to all of these veteran stories because they really do mean something. Thanks for tuning in. Well, we're veterans, so we spend a lot of time in mental health. Um, <laughs> Thanks for telling me. That's part of it, right? And uh, so, and we also teach a class called, uh, now it's called Rec for Heroes. It's a guitar class at the VA, uh, Fort Worth VA. And I've been teaching now for now five years and, and Ron has been helping me teach the disabled vets up there. And um, so I said, I got to thinking, you know what? The song is essentially three minutes with your therapist, right? I mean, it can make you up, make you down, whatever. So I uh, wrote a little bit about it and Ron is like, yeah, let's finish that song. Yeah, we sit down and it's called finish, three minutes. Of, yeah, we finished it in a thunderstorm. Yeah, that's so. right. Give me a three-minute session with my favorite Haggard song. Warm summer evening and the rumble of a storm. Find my direction, way to heal my wrongs with a. Song. Now therapists, they try their best an hour to work on you. Ask your questions, search for answers, take away your blues. I ain't saying that they don't help, one thing I know is true. One quick way to brighten my day is listen to my favorite tune. Give me a 
three-minute session with my favorite Leaving song. Warm summer evening and the rumble of a storm. Find my direction, way to do my wrongs. With a three-minute session in the form In the form of a country song. 